On behalf of Voice Works and Express Media, I would like to acknowledge that this event is broadcast from the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respect to the traditional custodians of all the lands from which our readers are presenting in this broadcast. We acknowledge the lands on which this broadcast reach and acknowledge First Nations peoples as the traditional custodians of this country, whose cultures are among the oldest living cultures in human history. We pay respect to the elders of these communities, past and present, and extend that to emerging community leaders. We recognise that sovereignty was never ceded and that colonisation is an ongoing process. It was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. Hello and welcome to the launch of VoiceWorks issue 120 themed Divine. I am your humble editor Adali Nash Hussain. Um, this issue we asked all of our contributors to describe some of their daily rituals be they uh, mundane or spiritual and we got a lot of really beautiful responses uh, including Vegemite on toast and Google Calendar and lighting and snuffing out candles and all manner of warm beverages. Um, seeing them all collected on the page was something that I found really moving uh, and so uh, as a way of giving that back and also uh, of utterly hiding my face for the rest of this speech I am now going to share some of my daily rituals with you. Cool. So, Divine features essays that use religion to understand trauma, art history and bad relationships. Fiction about tarot, mermaids and listening in on family Zoom calls. Poems that take you back generations and that take you on a simple walk with neighbourhood dogs. Our incredible cover this issue is by Valerie Schlossberg, whose ceramics draw on spirituality and protest in ways that resonate perfectly with this issue and this year. Our internal illustrations are by Edie Johnston, whose playful style evokes the sense of play and hope that we wanted this issue to explore. As always, I would like to thank our incredible writers and artists for trusting us with their incredible work. I would like to thank the editorial committee, many of whom renew this issue, but no less thoughtful or kind in their edits. I would like to thank our designer, Selena Refinis, and our other colleagues at Express Media. I would like to give an especially big thank you to Express's amazing outgoing general manager, CEO Le Lucy Hamilton. I have worked with Lucy as an edcomma, a school's tutor, and as the editor of VoiceWorks, and I've developed a huge trust in Lucy as somebody both good at listening and also good at acting, if that makes sense. While I'm sure I will still see her plenty across at Writers Victoria and across our respective lives, I'm still going to miss her a lot. Okay, on with the launch. We have some amazing readings for you today, starting with our own Darlene Silva Soberano. Darlene is an incredible poet, currently serving as a poetry editor for VoiceWorks. They have been published in Liminal, Cordite, Going Down Swinging and others, and are a recipient of a hot desk fellowship from the Wheeler Centre. Darlene reads Faux Fur Levi's Wallet. Hello everyone, I'm Darlene Silva Sobrano, and today I will be reading you the Ed Comitorial called Faux Fur Levi's Wallet. Depending on who I'm talking to, I am agnostic, a cultural Christian, a lapsed Catholic, and some people still know me as a full Catholic. Maybe this makes me spineless. How's that saying go? If you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. A phrase repeated throughout my adolescent years, which I spent devoted to a Catholic Filipino youth group. I'm a poet by vocation, and with this vocation comes a set of personal tenets. I believe that being a poet means that it is necessary to keep myself oriented towards compassion, vulnerability, and awe in order to write. I cannot follow a poem if it doesn't awe me. I want to be attuned to the daily conduits of wonder, be that children's laughter, a father's back, hand-holding. I have noticed, too, that awe is an experience underscored by a sense of helplessness. Can you believe this? One says in the face of a great pink sunset, there's an inherent vulnerability to a person who has stopped to stare at the sky. My grandmother died this year. She gave me her last gift in January, a yellow towel, her favorite color. This is so you'll never forget me, she said. I forgot to bring it back with me to Australia. 
When I realized I had forgotten it, I kept imagining her finding the towel after I was gone. In 2016, she bought me a faux fur Levi's wallet at Festival Mall for 450 pesos, which is about $12. I should have thrown it out a long time ago. It is dirtying my cards in such a way that I am afraid they will become unusable. But I keep this wallet together with neon orange duct tape and sewn orange threads. The last time I saw her, I did not know how to tell her about this talisman I kept. I can't speak the Galog, though she was the only one in my family who spoke it to me. She was the only one who believed me when I said I could understand. I did not offer her the same grace with English. I started taking Tagalog classes recently. During every class, inevitably, I have this moment where I imagine I am talking to her, and I try very hard to remain composed over Zoom. The reality is that I cannot put into the past what isn't there, though, in some ineffable way, the space of language learning is surreal enough to diminish the separation between my living and her death. My sincere, whole body wish is for my Lola to hear every word I am learning, relearning. When I practice, I speak to her. During these moments, I am transported so viscerally into the past, into an old room in the Philippines, and it is just us and there is no shame about how we speak. I ask her to tell me a story from 1973. I ask her to tell me about her mother. I tell her I love her and I miss her. I would call all of this a divine act. In my experiences as a former churchgoer and youth group devotee, I have noticed that there is a great effort to trick congregations into thinking that their experiences of the divine are the same. Certainly, culture and community is important, but I would say that the divine is largely personal and that one chooses what divinity is. Ultimately, beyond being a poet, my life's calling is to hold close what is divine to me for as long as I am able, to make the children laugh, to remind my father to go to his appointment, to take a friend's hand and keep it warm while we walk during winter in the city. Thank you all so much for listening. Oh my god. <clears throat> Next, we have Madison Brake reading for fiction. Madison Brake, 21, is a writer and editor. If she were a tarot card, she'd totally be the Empress. Today, Madison will be reading from her piece, Fools. I have loved every second of editing Fools, through beautifully evocative prose and a cast of characters that will remain in my heart for a long time. This piece explores the strong relationships between women through the lens of class and divinity, subverting ideas of mothering, the Australian dream, and boundaries of women futures. I hope you will love this story as much as I do. Please welcome Madison. Fools, the Chala. When I was 17, I kept a tarry deck inside my pillowcase. At night, mum wakes me to retrieve it. Her work friend, Laura, is always visiting to read their cards. It's only after mum leaves me one night that I think to join them. I crouch myself behind our dead relative's love seat in view of the dining table, and inhale its must and bones. Mum does not notice. This private act of watching is about memory, I think, with staleness blooming in my nose. Laura is facing me. I see the flesh of her fingers and wrists, how she softens at the stomach like there's a world globe inside her digestive tract. She reflects me, and I wait in this knowing that I am desirable, I have showy cheekbones. I have thighs that strain at pants in a way that seems intentional and enthralling all at once. I am a classic body with the womanhood of classic myth. She is a little better in that way middle-aged women are, and I fester. She's a high priestess in a Kmart uniform, or at least she could be. Laura is telling mum a story. She talks about a girl who had dreamed so foul that her family loaded her room with spiders to protect her. As suburban legend goes, 
thousands of daddy long legs wove their webs so the girl and her dreams vanished. Laura reckons the girl is still bundled up in their silky threads, trapped, waiting until her dreams stop entirely. I lean in to hear her shopping centre reports that the girl is actually living in Geelong somewhere. But I want to ask Laura what dreams were tasty enough to be devoured just for the mistake of conjuring them. Laura sees me. She seems sweaty, indifferent. She says hello. She asks me to cut the deck for them. I know this is something I'll remember when I'm older with my own dining room table and deck of cards. I know it's a moment I'll regret not writing down, but I move to sit with them regardless. Mum sighs as I reach for the deck. Here, the dry Melbourne heat leaves our faces sticky. The cards eat at my palms. The fool nibbles hard at my fingers for attention. I press the card to my skull before we start. It roots itself there and stays and stays and stays. My mother fans herself and tells me, you unsettle me like that. And then we all draw. Next up, we have Anya Dawn, reading her poem, She Does This Every Morning. Anya is a writer and experimenter of cultural identity, language, childhood memories, and shifting planes of time and space. She came to Australia last year and is studying philosophy and economics at the University of Sydney. She loves it here. This piece is about wading through anecdotes and wondering how past and present experiences a mother did or did not have make her who she is today. It's about living far away and dwelling on your understanding of a person to bring them closer to you despite the distance. I love how this piece lingers on the mother's hands, all that they have carried over time all the paths that they've taken or not taken. The images pull you into her life, leave you wishing you could hear the laughter, the singing. It's been a pleasure editing Anya's piece and seeing her relationship to poetry grow. I hope you all enjoy hearing these stories as much as I have. Please welcome Anya, reading She Does This Every Morning. She does this every morning. My mother's hands pierce. I write poems I am too scared to read. Palm scraped the ices of Nova Shakchinsk on her day off when she crawled all the way to a friend's house until the ice crumbled around her. How did she cope with the sting? And I often think about her knuckles knocking against each other when she hums Kogaimuru through the phone. Her throat must be burning so wild right now, like a whirlwind of gravel and warming brown sugar. Or she's cackling with her mouth gaped open when she eats a sticky date. It sticks to your teeth, but please don't tell her because I love watching her like that. It's easy to picture her in an ill-fitting lace dress, held by my father, dancing at her wedding to some Russian ballad None of us know the exact lyrics to because she almost does this every morning. But who else would I write about? I love my mother's hands, the ones that map trails as headstrong as her son's unearthing paths across our north-south terrains. Upon reflection, I think I do know the lyrics to Ala Pugashova's Million Scarlet Roses. My mother you weren't a mail courier nor a 1991 ukraine factory button sewer but i imagine you beaming like you outran those firecrackers that blew our bridges up your hands have barely memorized our vernacular letters too busy too deep in low-lying fields squeezing the juices out of that itchy plant fanning blowing and kissing piping pineapple soup in fractured porcelain bowls that you'll never throw away. Your hands, 
I hear they're in constant war with each other. Only held a chopstick in school once, but tough as an ox's bare back in the sun. And in the morning, they sing along to that song you love. The next reading is the non-fiction piece, Notes on Clover from Totally Spies by Mason Wood. Mason Wood is a writer living and working on unceded Wanturi land. He is interested in social theory, the queer body and Alan's killer pythons. This essay explores pop culture gems from Sailor Moon to Lady Gaga through a queer lens. It speaks to femme childhoods, to worshipping at the altar of divas, and importantly, to the redheads who made us gay. I love how it basks in gut memory and its resistance of a single narrative of femininity or gender itself. It is a piece about queer storytelling and is queer storytelling. Please welcome Mason Wood reading Notes on Clover from Totally Spies. It's the mid-2000s and the school playground is out of bounds for obvious reasons. It's the territory of boys named things like John or Jack who are playing rough and tumble games. Instead, I circle the oval with my friend and fellow teacher's pet, Lara. We're probably fighting over who gets to play Sam in our recess reenactment of Totally Spies. At the intersection of Charlie's Angels, Sailor Moon, and trashy preteen fashion magazines, the series is every femme nerd's dream. It features Alex, Clover, and Sam, three teenage girls attending Beverly Hills High. With a pretty provocative premise, the show asks, how do these girls have time to ace their history tests? impress some school hottie, and prevent the kidnapping of world leaders. It's irreverent, profound, and really important stuff. Lara is about to use her laser lipstick to infiltrate the enemy HQ. Then, I realise that she is pretending to be the red-headed green catsuit wearing de facto leader of the trio, Sam, and I distinctively do not remember giving her permission. Sam is the smartest student of Ev High. She's beautiful and loyal, she has time for her studies, her friends, and for her professional career of stabilising international conflict. Not to mention her hair is the best colour out of the three girls, which is obviously the most important factor when you're in primary school. Sam is my favourite character. I adamantly fight my way through our 20 minute recess break to make sure I do not come out as the Tom boyish Alex. It's 2020 and I have all this spare time for some reason, so I decide to start binging Totally Spies. It doesn't require a lot of thinking, and unlike other animated shows, each episode of the girls wear different cartoony 2000s outfits that are easy to get lost in. Observers might point out that young cisgender boys having feminine interests is an early indicator of latent homosexuality. As I lie in bed, with my laptop shrinking into my tummy, hypothesising about the miniskirt length to confidence ratio, I'd argue we just have taste. You see, I'm watching Clover first after some normie looking blonde, and I'm thinking about why it is that I find such safety in these cartoon divas. I'm thinking about all the women in pop culture I have seemingly worshipped throughout my life. Like others, I am largely a stereotype, in that diva worship continues to be a key element of my queer sensibility. While the divas I worship are made of both flesh, flesh and animation, they all share an overproduced camp and often tragic femininity. Scholars have long been fascinated with and track the ostensibly religious fan diva bond between divas and the gay men that worship them. The diva typically embodies a frivolous and performative femininity, qualities gay men have damned from themselves. Thus, we work to canonise figures who demonstrate the campiness and any subsequent confidence that we feel we do not have free access to. Because femininity remains taboo for all men, including gays, those who seek to embrace their femme continue to find pride in that which feels off limits, making diva worship an enduring queer practice. My knowledge of cartoon and real-life divas grants me a specific literacy around my chosen queens. Queers build a sense of community around this shared worship, Unfortunately, this continues to put barriers up around what mainstream queer culture is and can be, 
typically defined by the tastes of white cis gay men appropriating the behaviours of those more marginalised than them. I'm on Twitter and I see a tweet that reads, you're either a totally spies gay, a Winx Club gay, or a witch gay. I think about how I am probably all three. This tweet contributes to an army of memes that follow a pretty simple formula. Text slash character from childhood made me gay. The idea that exposure to text not designed for your assigned gender inverts your sexuality is obviously ridiculous and silly, but I also just keep blaming my parents that this is all their fault. I'm thinking about whether I'm allowed to enjoy things in a vacuum. It starts with mulling over the male gaze and feminine aggrandizement. Then, how gay men often feel like they get to abstain from misogyny because they are not sexually attracted to women and they too suffer from the heteropatriarchy. Some theorists suggest that gay men worshipping feminine divas can occur away from misogynistic paradigms, as the relationship models typical notions of desire and the gaze. In looking, we move away from acquisition and towards embodiment. It's not what gay men can acquire from diva women, but instead, what does it mean to be a diva at all? An identity construct and performance that consistently blurs gender lines. I'm thinking about whether this is good enough. I'm thinking about what happens when men worship exaggerations of femininity, and how it is often black divas and divas of colour who are the subject of the cis-white gay imagination. I'm trying to interrogate my relationship to pop stars and drag and childhood cartoons, and I hear Clover say, if we're going to do this whole spy thingy, we're going to have to do it with some style. I'm thinking, is Clover from Totally Spies a feminist scholar? I'm in the garden and I'm not wearing shoes. It's either summer or late spring. I know this because Dad is home early from work. He's coming up the driveway and I'm talking to myself. I'm holding a charm above my head. It's probably an old earring or a doorknob that Dad fastened to the end of a stick to make me a wand. I throw my body around. I'm spinning, spinning, spinning. Some synthy pop song plays in my head. Ribbons of light wrap around my arms, legs, and torso. Dainty wings sprout from my back. A tiara sits gently on my head. And I pose. The transformation sequence, popularized by the magical girl genre, is a keystone element of many anime and other non-Japanese texts that include a henshin hero meaning a character that doesn't always have access to their abilities and must power up to use them. Female characters tend to undergo their transformations through magic and clothing, while boys undergo transformations through science, robots, and technology. While these shows were produced to represent a gendered view of childhood, queer audiences have revered the magical girls and their transformation sequences. Like many others, I was drawn to the positive representation of a hyper-stylized, confident, and camp femininity. Often femme characters are viewed to be strong if they can reject the traditional gender binds, akin to manning up, but the magical girl genre reminds viewers that they do not need to cast off their femininity to be powerful. Instead, by embracing your femme, and in most instances exaggerating it, you can come out on top. In one instance, this can feel like it's working to reinforce traditional gender stereotypes, and in a way, it is, especially if there are no alternative representations of girls on our screens. But for young femmes, of all genders, it also works to remind you that being covered in bows and butterflies does not make you weak. As a child, I would play for hours in the garden, coming up with new transformation sequences for myself and the legion of femmes that were living rent-free in my head. I'm wearing my disheveled Daria t-shirt that I probably bought off Redbubble in the mid-2010s. Daria's upper face and disapproving eyes lets her discontent lie in my belly. I bought the shirt during the height of Tumblr, using my fashion to signal a particular version of faux alternativeness, asking to be seen by my fellow late 90s babies, letting them know that I am indeed one of them. Look at me, I'm full of Gen Z dread too. A boy I liked in high school introduced me to MTV's Daria. It was arguably around this time that I also developed a personality, not sure if there's a correlation. Though not a diva by traditional standards, Daria and her peers have risen into queer stardom, she swiftly became the voice of an anti-social generation, consistently calling out the excessive consumerism of 90s capitalism, a pizza-eating, essay-writing, Doc Martin-wearing, sports-refusing, family-din-ruining queen. With her limited animation style and sarcasm, Daria is the antithesis to everything frilly and femme. Her criticism of traditional modes of femininity complicate my understanding of cartoon diva worship. You see, the problem with most of the femme characters that I had worshipped up until this point, and something that ugly rebukes them of their queer icon status, is that they actually enjoyed high school. 
There are no truer words than Dario's graduation speech. In my experience, high school sucks. Regardless of Dario's canon sexuality, she embodied a seemingly queer mode of existence. She lived her teenage years on the outside, resisting traditional heteronormative monogamous institutions and straight time, school, work, marriage, house, baby, death. Daria tells her therapist, I'm so defensive that I actually work to make people dislike me. So I won't feel bad when they do. Most interestingly, Daria admits that she's not set out to destroy straight time, weird I know, but instead uses her misery as a defensive tactic. Daria's ambivalence towards belonging makes her inconceivably queer. She craves a community but remains afraid of being rejected for any apparent authenticity. In their essay of Standing on My Neck, Feminist Cynicism and Queer and Sociality in MTV's Daria, Robin Alex MacDonald calls Daria an important feminist killjoy and queer cynic. She rejects the capitalist beliefs of optimism, ambition, success, and championship, giving the rude finger to classic coming-of-age girlhood narratives. Narratives that up until this point saturated the programming that I had bastioned and worshipped in my youth. Though despite Daria's resistance to the hyperfem binary, I have not taken her lead and rejected the values that are more evident in her vapid sister Quinn. Instead, I'm learning that divadom does not manifest in one representation of femininity, but many. The people of all genders have access to the diva and all her incarnations to perform whatever version of femininity they choose. On any given day, I blur these femme figures inside of my gut. I sit in my big black boots with Daria, self-loathing and ruining my sharehouse dinners with a silly comment. I put on heels, dream of makeup, and spend far too much time in the mirror. And I commit to one monochromatic outfit, as if I'm Sailor Brunswick. Thank you. Well, that's all, folks. To read all of the rest of the amazing pieces in the magazine, you can head to our website where print and ebook copies of the mag can be purchased, as well as back issues. Thanks to all of our amazing readers once again, and thanks for watching.